Hello everyone, Ladis Las Maurice from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today I am right in front of the Panama Canal here in Panama City together with Calvin. Calvin, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. So Calvin runs a research service on shipping and we'll be discussing some of the latest developments which are really huge that few people are discussing and that are going to have a very big impact on the economy if it continues this way. So can you tell us about, about the developments here at the Panama Canal? and also at the Suez Canal. Right, so, you know, the uh, Panama Canal was completed in the early 20th century. The Suez Canal was completed mid 19th century. And we've essentially never had a situation where both of these canals have had their throughput greatly affected at the same time for a long time. Uh, that's uh, very big for shipping. It's very big for a lot of commodity shipping, retail shipping. It's inflationary. Um, it causes uh, congestion, delays, supply chain issues. So it's definitely, you know, anything that uh, any, anybody who follows economics or markets should be, you know, this should be right at the center of their focus. So throughput is down by how much here at the Panama Canal? Yeah, it's, it's about 50%. And why? So in Panama, the issue is that the uh, l water level of Gatun Lake, it's a freshwater lake and it's what they use to regulate the uh, locks. So the, the, you know, essentially the uh, Panama uh, uh, is an isthmus and the Atlantic and Pacific sides uh, are not exactly at the, you know, they're not at the same elevation, right? And uh, you have to uh, essentially change the water level to get uh, a ship between the two sides. So in order to do that, they, you know, the ship goes into the lock, uh, the uh, canal pumps the water in, and that either raises or lowers the ship down to uh, the level, or, or up to the level that it needs to be to, uh, to pass through. So in, in the middle of these two saltwater sources, you have a freshwater source. And you know, you can't, you can't uh, contaminate the freshwater with the saltwater, so you can only use freshwater to regulate the water levels. So is this just a one-off or is it recurring? Because <clears throat> uh, it so wasn't in, like this before. In 2016, before. they did an expansion of the canal so that they could allow bigger ships to go through. And so uh, there have been you know, droughts before in Panama's history, but right now the uh, seasonal water levels in the lake are by far the most extreme uh, low that they've ever been. Um, I think that it's probably a mix of uh, factors, the uh, canal expansion and uh, sort of the seasonal, uh, you know, uh, weather patterns. Uh, El Nino, this is typically the dry uh, part of, of the year. Uh, it's going to get drier over the next couple of months. So, uh, but this has been something that's been sort of getting worse with time. So it's partially structural and partially seasonal. So what, what's the alternative for, for shippers? Well, the alternative to going through the Panama Canal is to go around South America. And obviously, you know, that's a lot longer. How so many that's, days that's, extra? Uh, it you know, different ships travel at different speeds, but, you know, let's say minimum, it's uh, anywhere from a few weeks to a month. Wow. So. Inflationary. Definitely inflationary. Um, the other, uh, you know, the other aspect is, I don't think it's really affected uh, Panama's budget so much. Um, because they've essentially, you know, raised uh, rates um, and, you know, they've also implemented an auction system so that, you know, people can uh, bid to get a slot to go through. Um, but yeah, reducing that throughput has had huge effects uh, on, uh, on shippers, energy traders, uh, commodity traders. Um, I, I had dinner with a, an energy trader in Spain. He's the guy that books the ships. I asked him, what, what would make the biggest impact on your business? And he said, uh, knowing uh, when the Panama Canal auctions will be and how much they will be. Because you just you know, can't really plan um, if you have uh, some you know, huge cost that, uh, and you know, huge time delay that you, you don't really know what it's going to be until it, until it comes. So the situation here is quite bad, but what about the, the Suez Canal? Right, so the Suez Canal, the issue is the, uh, the Houthis uh, in Yemen have uh, essentially said that they don't want to uh, let any ship with ties to Israel go through the, uh, the Red Sea. The Red Sea is the southern entrance to the Suez Canal. And, you know, obviously shipping is global. Um, if you think about, you know, where a ship would call port, 
you know, who are the shareholders of shipping companies. Uh, theoretically, you could make a connection to Israel with just about any ship. So the Houthis have been, you know, firing uh, missiles. Uh, they're supported by Iran with uh, a lot of technical services and weapons. They do represent a very credible threat. They're not just goat herders. They do have advanced ballistics capabilities. They were the first uh, group in the world to hit a moving ship with a ballistic missile. So That's impressive. The, the way that a ballistic missile works is essentially, uh, you know, you, you fire something from the ground and then it comes back down with, uh, the, uh, with gravity, right? So uh, it's not, you know, so much a, uh, a guided missile. It's not a cruise missile. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty complicated to uh, hit a moving target with uh, ballistic missiles. Um, ballistics are typically used to hit large stationary things like cities. And the throughput is down by how much there? Yeah, so the Suez throughput, uh, let's, let's say it's also down on average about half. The container sector has been by far the most affected. Um, the container sector has had its throughput reduced. You know, it varies day to day. It's been as much as 90%. Let's say it's 70% uh, on average now. Yeah, so this is very, on a separate note, this is very bearish for Egypt, uh, which has a very deep current account deficit issue. So suddenly all of that income being gone is absolutely not bullish Egypt. So what's the alternative route then? Well, the alternative route is around Africa. And how many extra weeks is that? Anywhere from a few weeks to a month, depending on the speed of the ship. <laughs> Same as the issue here. And so we've had the Suez Canal being closed down for a few years in the past. Right. What was the impact on the whole shipping industry back then? Well, in the from the 67 to 75 closure, the uh, that was sort of when the age of the super tanker started. And that, you know, age started because they needed to find a new way to get oil out of the Middle East because they couldn't really rely on the Suez Canal. So the, uh, they started building these uh, very large crude carriers, which were basically, you know, gigantic football, multiple football field size ships for carrying crude oil. Uh, between 1970 and 1975, the size of that fleet increased by about 15x. Wow. Okay. So looking at the current situation, I see inflation from two sides. One is with the increase in shipping rates yeah. because it takes longer and two, all the supply chain disruptions. So, you know, if right. a, a spare part was to take three weeks before, now it might take six weeks. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you said, one, you get backed up on shipments. If you have a, an industrial operation and you really need some, uh, some components, those components are on a ship, they're you know, back a couple of weeks, then now your customers are down a couple of weeks, their customers are down a couple of weeks. So that's sort of the same thing that we saw after COVID. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting also uh, watching some of the skepticism from people on uh, whether or not this would have global impacts. And I've said from the very beginning, absolutely it will have global impacts. Um, both of these canals having their throughput impacted to this level um, is, is a historically unprecedented. Uh, and uh, if, it, if this situation persists, uh, you're, you're gonna see freight rates much higher uh, pretty much across the board. It's, it's going to cause more congestion. It's going to cause schedule slippage. And uh, you know, it's it's not just like one little area is affected. Shipping's global. You mess things up considerably, in you know one key choke point, you've affected the whole planet. So bullish reshoring. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, the the thing about reshoring is you need to have the industrial capacity in place to do it. It's not an overnight solution. It takes years to build factories and highways and railroads and pipelines. Right, so it's uh, it's not an overnight solution, and uh, the uh, the steel production capacity, for instance, or the cement production capacity in the United States is also limited. There's a lot of components that we just simply don't produce here anymore. A lot of electronics that we don't make here, right? So you can't uh, go from a very globalized world to 
a uh, somewhat decentralized world in a short time period. And even and you know even if you do move towards that, uh, you know globalization has been a very deflationary trend, right? Um, you, you know we're talking about lower and lower costs, faster and faster delivery schedules. You know very. Uh, a very uh, optimized uh, shipment processes, uh, and that has really been enabled, you know, sort of by the Pax Americana, American global dominance, and uh, you know, protecting shipping lanes. But it seems like we're not really able to uh, to do that anymore. So you know, now if you need, you know, a factory in the U.S. or Mexico or Brazil um, that does the same things that a factory in uh, in China was doing, uh, you know making those new factories and making those new products, all these redundancies, uh, it, it might be bad for the producers of those products. They might see you know, lower earnings in China because they don't have as many customers. Um, but on a global basis, you're talking about the need for a lot more raw materials in those, uh, in those local levels. I would say long-term uh, reshoring is probably structurally bearish, uh, large ships. Um, but uh, again, it's something that's going to take a very long time to happen. Interesting. So essentially, your research service takes this sort of thinking and research and translate itself into a model portfolio, correct? Right. We have a model portfolio. We post trade ideas. We, uh, we post uh, weekly updates. So we sort of follow the sector fundamentals. We follow the companies. We follow the commodities. We follow the, the big industrial companies. You know, shipping is sort of, uh, you know, most of human trade revolves around stuff moving around on ships. It's the most efficient form of transport. So uh, I, I think that if you, you know, want to really uh, get an edge in the markets, uh, you can't do better than studying shipping. Interesting. Great. So if you're interested, there is an affiliate link below with a 20% discount for his newsletter. There is both an annual plan and a monthly plan. So you just want to try it for a month, low risk, you can try that as well. Great, Calvin. Thank, thank you very you. much. Always a pleasure. Yep. Make sure to download my free ebook, 12 Mistakes to Avoid When Investing in International Real Estate, which you can find on my website, link below. And feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.